Shalcan the Painter by Joseph Sheridan Lefano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. Shalcan the Painter by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu. For he is not a man as I am that we should come together. Neither is there any that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him therefore take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. There exists at this moment in good preservation a remarkable work of Schalken's. The curious management of its lights constitutes, as usual in his pieces, the chief apparent merit of the picture. I say apparent, for in its subject, and not in its handling, however exquisite, consists its real value. The picture represents the interior of what might be a chamber in some antique religious building, and its foreground is occupied by a female figure in a species of white robe, part of which is arranged so as to form a veil. The dress, however, is not that of any religious order. In her hand the figure bears a lamp, by which alone her figure and face are illuminated, and her features wear such an arch smile as well becomes a pretty woman when practising some prankish roguery. In the background, and, excepting where the dim red light of an expiring fire serves to define the form in total shadow, stands the figure of a man dressed in the old Flemish fashion, in an attitude of alarm, his hand being placed upon the hilt of his sword, which he appears to be in the act of drawing. There are some pictures which impress one, I know not how, with the conviction that they represent not the mere ideal shapes and combinations which have floated through the imagination of the artist, but scenes, faces, and situations which have actually existed. There is in that strange picture something that stamps it as the representation of a reality. And such in truth it is, for it faithfully records a remarkable and mysterious occurrence, and perpetuates in the face of the female figure which occupies the most prominent place in the design, an accurate portrait of Rose Veldekaus, the niece of Gerard Dow, the first, and, I believe, the only love of Godfrey Schalken. My great-grandfather knew the painter well, and from Schalken himself he learned the fearful story of the painting, and from him, too, he ultimately received the picture itself as a bequest. The story and the picture have become heirlooms in my family, and, having described the latter, I shall, if you please, attempt to relate the tradition which has descended with the canvas. There are few forms on which the mantle of romance hangs more ungracefully than upon that of the uncouth Schalken, the boorish but most cunning worker in oils, whose pieces delight the critics of our day almost as much as his manners disgusted the refined of his own, and yet this man, so rude, so dogged, so slovenly, in the midst of his celebrity, had, in his obscure but happier days, played the hero in a wild romance of mystery and passion. When Schalken studied under the immortal Gerard Dow, 
he was a very young man, and in spite of his phlegmatic temperament, he at once fell over head and ears in love with the beautiful niece of his wealthy master. Rose Veldekaust was still younger than he, having not yet attained her seventeenth year, and, if tradition speaks truth, possessed all the soft and dimpling charms of the fair, light-haired Flemish maidens. The young painter loved honestly and fervently. His frank adoration was rewarded. He declared his love, and extracted a faltering confession in return. He was the happiest and proudest painter in all Christendom. But there was somewhat to dash his elation. He was poor and undistinguished. He dared not ask old Gerard for the hand of his sweet ward. He must first win a reputation and a competence. There were, therefore, many dread uncertainties and cold days before him. He had to fight his way against sore odds. But he had won the heart of dear Rose Veldekaus, and that was half the battle. It is needless to say his exertions were redoubled, and his lasting celebrity proves that his industry was not unrewarded by success. These ardent labours, and were still, the hopes that elevated and beguiled them, were, however, destined to experience a sudden interruption of a character so strange and mysterious as to baffle all inquiry, and to throw over the events themselves a shadow of preternatural horror. Shalkin had one evening outstayed all his fellow pupils, and still pursued his work in the deserted room. As the daylight was fast falling, he laid aside his colours, and applied himself to the completion of a sketch on which he had expressed extraordinary pains. It was a religious composition and represented the temptations of a pot-bellied St. Anthony. The young artist, however destitute of elevation, had, nevertheless, discernment enough to be dissatisfied with his own work, and many were the patient erasures and improvements which saint and devil underwent, yet all in vain. The large old-fashioned room was silent, and with the exception of himself, quite emptied of its usual inmates. An hour had thus passed away, nearly two, without any improved result. Daylight had already declined, and twilight was deepening into the darkness of night. The patience of the young painter was exhausted, and he stood before his unfinished production angry and mortified, one hand buried in the folds of his long hair, and the other holding the piece of charcoal which had so ill performed its office, and which he now rubbed without much regard to the sable streaks it produced, with irritable pressure upon his ample Flemish inexpressibles. "'Curse the subject!' said the young man aloud. Curse the picture, the devils, the saint! At this moment, a short, sodden sniff, uttered close beside him, made the artist turn sharply round, and he now, for the first time, became aware that his labours had been overlooked by a stranger. Within about a yard and half, and rather behind him, there stood the figure of an elderly man in a cloak and broad-brimmed conical hat. In his hand, which was protected with a heavy gauntlet-shaped glove, he carried a long ebony walking-stick, surmounted with what appeared, as it glittered dimly in the twilight, to be a massive head of gold. And upon his breast 
through the folds of the cloak there shone the links of a rich chain of the same metal the room was so obscure that nothing further of the appearance of the figure could be ascertained and his hat threw his features into profound shadow it would not have been easy to conjecture the age of the intruder but a quantity of dark hair escaping from beneath this sombre hat as well as his firm and upright carriage served to indicate that his years could not yet exceed threescore or thereabouts there was an air of gravity and importance about the garb of the person and something indescribably odd i might say awful in the perfect stone-like stillness of the figure that effectually checked the testy comment which had at once risen to the lips of the irritated artist he therefore as soon as he had sufficiently recovered his surprise asked the stranger civilly to be seated and desired to know if he had any message to leave for his master tell gerard dole said the unknown without altering his attitude in the smallest degree that mynheer van der hausen of rotterdam desires to speak with him on to-morrow evening at this hour and if he please in this room upon matters of weight that is all the stranger having finished this message turned abruptly and with a quick but silent step quitted the room before Shalkin had time to say a word in reply the young man felt a curiosity to see in what direction the burgher of rotterdam would turn on quitting the studio and for that purpose he went directly to the window which commanded the door a lobby of considerable extent intervened between the inner door of the painter's room and the street entrance so that Shalkin occupied the post of observation before the old man could possibly have reached the street he watched in vain however there was no other mode of exit had the queer old man vanished or was he lurking about the recesses of the lobby for some sinister purpose this last suggestion filled the mind of shalcombe with a vague uneasiness which was so unaccountably intense as to make him alike afraid to remain in the room alone and reluctant to pass through the lobby however with an effort which appeared very disproportioned to the occasion he summoned resolution to leave the room and having locked the door and thrust the key in his pocket without looking to the right or left he traversed the passage which had so recently perhaps still contained the person of his mysterious visitant scarcely venturing to breathe till he had arrived in the open street mein herr vanderhausen said gerard dull within himself as the appointed hour approached mein herr vanderhausen of rotterdam i never heard of the man till yesterday what can he want of me a portrait perhaps to be painted or a poor relation to be apprenticed or a collection to be valued up up a shop there's no one in rotterdam to leave me a legacy well whatever the business may be we shall soon know it all it was now the close of day and again every easel except that of shalcon was deserted gerard dow was pacing the apartment with the restless step of impatient expectation sometimes pausing to glance over the work of one of his absent pupils but more frequently placing himself at the window from whence he might observe the passengers who threaded the obscure by-street in which his studio was placed said you not godfrey exclaimed dow after a long and fruitful gaze from his post of observation and turning to shalcombe 
that the hour he appointed was about seven by the clock of the stud house. It had just told seven when I first saw him, sir, answered the student. The hour is close at hand, then, said the master, consulting a horologe as large and as round as an orange. Mein Herr Banderhausen from Rotterdam, is it not so? Such was the name and an elderly man richly clad pursued dow musingly as well as i might see replied his pupil he could not be young nor yet very old neither and his dress was rich and grave as might become a citizen of wealth and consideration at this moment the sonorous boom of the stadhouse clock told stroke after stroke the hour of seven. The eyes of both master and student were directed to the door, and it was not until the last peal of the bell had ceased to vibrate that Dow exclaimed, So, so, we shall have his worship presently, that is, if he means to keep his hour. If not, you may wait for him, Godfrey, if you court his acquaintance. But what, after all, if it should prove but a mummery got up by Bankarp or some such wag. I wish you would run all risks and cudgel the old burgomaster Sandlick. I'd wager a dozen of Rhenish. His worship would have unmasked and pleaded old acquaintance in a trice. Here he comes, sir, said Chalcom, in a low monetary tone, and instantly, upon turning towards the door, Gerard Dow observed the same figure which had on the day before so unexpectedly greeted his pupil Shalcom. There was something in the air of the figure which at once satisfied the painter that there was no masquerading in the case, and that he really stood in the presence of a man of worship. And so, without hesitation, he doffed his cap, and courteously saluting the stranger, requested him to be seated. The visitor waved his hand slightly, as if in acknowledgment of the courtesy, but remained standing. "'I have the honour to see Meinherr van der Hausen of Rotterdam,' said Gerard Dow. "'The same,' was the laconic reply of his visitor. I understand your worship desires to speak with me, continued Dow, and I am here by appointment to wait your commands. Is that a man of trust? said van der Housen, turning toward Schalken, who stood at a little distance behind his master. Certainly, replied Gerard. Then let him take this box and get the nearest jeweller or goldsmith to value its contents, and let him return hither with a certificate of the valuation. At the same time he placed a small case, about nine inches square, in the hands of Gerard Dow, who was as much amazed at its weight as at the strange abruptness with which it was handed to him. In accordance with the wishes of the stranger, he delivered it into the hands of Shalkin, and, repeating his direction, it dispatched him upon the mission. Shalkin disposed his precious charge securely beneath the folds of his cloak, and, rapidly traversing two or three narrow streets, he stopped at a corner house, the lower part of which was then occupied by the shop of a Jewish goldsmith. He entered the shop, and calling the little Hebrew into the obscurity of its back recesses, he proceeded to lay before him van der Housen's casket. On being examined by the light of a lamp, it appeared entirely cased with lead, the outer surface of which was much scraped and soiled, and nearly white with age. This having been partially removed, there appeared beneath a box of some hard wood, which also they forced open, and after the removal of two or three folds of linen, 
they discovered its contents to be a mass of golden ingots, closely packed, and, as the Jew declared, of the most perfect quality. Every ingot underwent the scrutiny of the little Jew, who seemed to feel an epicurean delight in touching and testing these morsels of the glorious metal, and each one of them was replaced in its birth with the exclamation, Mein Gott, how very perfect! Not one grain of alloy! or oh, beautiful, beautiful! The task was at length finished, and the Jew certified under his hand the value of the ingot submitted to his examination to amount to many thousand rix dollars. With the desired document in his pocket, and the rich box of gold carefully pressed under his arm and concealed by his cloak, he retraced his way, and, entering the studio, found his master and the stranger in close conference. Shalken had no sooner left the room, in order to execute the commission he had taken in charge, than van der Housen addressed Gerard Dole in the following terms. I cannot tarry with you to-night more than a few minutes, and so I shall shortly tell you the matter upon which I come. You visited the town of Rotterdam some four months ago, and then I saw in the church of St. Lawrence your niece, Rose Valdekaus. I desire to marry her, and if I satisfy you that I am wealthier than any husband you can dream of for her, I expect that you will forward my suit with your authority. If you approve my proposal, you must close with it here and now, for I cannot wait for calculations and delays. Gerard Dow was hugely astonished by the nature of Meinherr van der Hausen's communication, but he did not venture to express surprise, for besides the motives supplied by prudence and politeness, the painter experienced a kind of chill and depression, like that which is said to intervene when one is placed in unconscious proximity with the object of a natural antipathy, an undefined but overpowering sensation while standing in the presence of the eccentric stranger, which made him very unwilling to say anything which might reasonably offend him. "'I have no doubt,' said Gerard, after two or three preparatory hums, "'that the alliance which you propose would prove alike advantageous and honourable to my niece. But you must be aware that she has a will of her own,' and may not acquiesce in what we may design for her advantage. Do not seek to deceive me, Sir Painter, said van der Hussen. You are her guardian, she is your ward. She is mine, if you like to make her so. The man of Rotterdam moved forward a little as he spoke, and Gerard Dow, he scarce knew why, inwardly prayed for the speedy return of Shalcom. I desire, said the mysterious gentleman, to place in your hands at once an evidence of my wealth and a security for my liberal dealing with your niece. The lad will return in a minute or two with a sum in value five times the fortune which she has a right to expect from her husband. This shall lie in your hands together with her dowry, and you may apply the united sum as suits her interest best. It shall be all exclusively hers while she lives. Is that liberal? Dow assented, and inwardly acknowledged that fortune had been extraordinarily kind to his niece. The stranger, he thought, must be both wealthy and generous, and such an offer was not to be despised, though made by a humorist and one of no very prepossessing presence. Rose had no very high pretensions, for she had but a modest dowry, which she owed entirely to the generosity of her uncle. Neither had she any right to raise exceptions on the score of birth, for her own origin was 
far from splendid, and as the other objections Gerard resolved, and indeed by the usages of the time was warranted in resolving not to listen to them for a moment. Sir, said he, addressing the stranger, your offer is liberal, and whatever hesitation I may feel in closing with it immediately arises solely from my not having the honour of knowing anything of your family or station. Upon these points you can, of course, satisfy me without difficulty. As to my respectability, said the stranger dryly, you must take that for granted at present. A pester me with no inquiries. You can discover nothing more about me than I choose to make known. You shall have sufficient security for my respectability, my word, if you are honourable, if you are sordid, my gold. A testy old gentleman, thought Tao. He must have his own way, but all things considered, I am not justified in declining his offer. I will not pledge myself unnecessarily, however. You will not pledge yourself unnecessarily, said Van der Housen, strangely uttering the very words which had just floated through the mind of his companion. But you will do so if it is necessary, I presume. And I will show you that I consider it indispensable. If the gold I mean to leave in your hands satisfy you, and if you don't wish my proposal to be at once withdrawn, you must, before I leave this room, write your name to this engagement. Having thus spoken, he placed a paper in the hands of the master, the contents of which expressed an engagement entered into by Gerard Dow to give to Wilken van der Hausen of Rotterdam in marriage, Rose Veldekast, and so forth, within one week of the date thereof. While the painter was employed in reading this covenant, by the light of a twinkling oil lamp in the far wall of the room, Schalken, as we have stated, entered the studio, and having delivered the box and the valuation of the Jew into the hands of the stranger, he was about to retire, when Van der Hausen called to him to wait, and presenting the case and the certificate to Gerard Daum, he paused in silence until he had satisfied himself by an inspection of both respecting the value of the pledge left in his hands. At length he said, Are you content? The painter said he would fain have another day to consider. Not an hour, said the suitor, apathetically. Well then, said Dab, with a sore effort, I am content it is a bargain. Then sign at once, said Van der Hausen, for I am weary. At the same time, he produced a small case of writing materials, and Gerard signed the important document. Let this youth witness the covenant, said the old man, and Godfrey Schalken unconsciously attested the instrument which forever bereft him of his dear Rose Veldekaus. The compact being thus completed, the strange visitor folded up the paper and stowed it safely in an inner pocket. I will visit you tomorrow night at nine o'clock at your own house, Gerard Dow and we'll see the object of our contract. And so saying, Wilken van der Hausen 
moved stiffly but rapidly out of the room. Shalcom, eager to resolve his doubts, had placed himself by the window in order to watch the street entrance, but the experiment served only to support his suspicions, for the old man did not issue from the door. Oh, this was very strange, oh, nay, fearful. He and his master returned together, and talked but little on the way, for each had his own subjects of reflection, of anxiety, and of hope. Shalkin, however, did not know the ruin which menaced his dearest projects. Gerard Dole knew nothing of the attachment which had sprung up between his pupil and his niece, and even if he had, it is doubtful whether he would have regarded its existence as any serious obstruction to the wishes of Minor van der Housen. Marriages were then and there matters of traffic and calculation, and it would have appeared as absurd in the eyes of the guardian to make a mutual attachment an essential element in a contract of the sort, as it would have been to draw up his bonds and receipts in the language of romance. The painter, however, did not communicate to his niece the important step which he had taken in her behalf. A forbearance caused not by any anticipated opposition on her part, but solely by a ludicrous consciousness that if she were to ask him for a description of her destined bridegroom, he would be forced to confess that he had not once seen his face, and if called upon, would find it absolutely impossible to identify him. Upon the next day, Gerard Dow after dinner, called his niece to him, and having scanned her person with an air of satisfaction, he took her hand, and looking upon her pretty innocent face with a smile of kindness, he said, Rose, my girl, that face of yours will make your fortune. Rose blushed and smiled. Such faces and such tempers seldom go together, and when they do, the compound is a love charm. Few heads or hearts can resist. Trust me, you will soon be a bride girl. But this is trifling, and I am pressed for time, so make ready the large room by eight o'clock tonight, and give directions for supper at nine. I expect a friend, and observe me, child, do you trick yourself out handsomely? I will not have him think us poor or sluttish. With these words he left her, and took his way to the room in which his pupils worked. When the evening closed in, Gerard called Shalcom, who was about to take his departure to his own obscure and comfortless lodgings, and asked him to come home and sup with Rose and Vanderhausen. The invitation was, of course, accepted, and Gerard Dow and his pupil soon found themselves in the handsome and even then antique chamber which had been prepared for the reception of the stranger a cheerful wood fire blazed in the hearth a little at one side of which an old-fashioned table which shone in the firelight like burnished gold was awaiting the supper for which preparations were going forward and ranged with exact regularity stood the tall back chairs whose ungracefulness was more than compensated by their comfort the little party consisting of rose her uncle and the artist awaited the arrival of the expected visitor with considerable impatience nine o'clock at length came and with it a summons at the street door, which, being speedily answered, was followed by a slow and emphatic tread upon the staircase. The steps moved heavily across the lobby. The door of the room in which the party we have described were assembled slowly opened, and there entered a figure 
which startled, almost appalled, the phlegmatic Dutchman, and nearly made Rose scream with terror. It was the form, and arrayed in the garb, of mein Herr van der Hausen. The air, the gait, the height were the same, but the features had never been seen by any of the party before. The stranger stopped at the door of the room, and displayed his form and face completely. He wore a dark-coloured cloth cloak, which was short and full, not falling quite to his knees. His legs were cased in dark purple silk stockings, and his shoes were adorned with roses of the same colour. The opening of the cloak in front showed the undersuit to consist of some very dark, perhaps sable material, and his hands were enclosed in a pair of heavy leather gloves, which ran up considerably above the wrist, in the manner of a gauntlet. In one hand he carried his walking-stick, and his hat, which he had removed, and the other hung heavily by his side. A quantity of grizzled hair descended in long tresses from his head, and rested upon the plait of a stiff ruff, which effectually concealed his neck. So far all was well, but the face! Ah, the flesh of the face was coloured with the bluish leaden hue, which is sometimes produced by metallic medicines administered in excessive quantities. The eyes showed an undue proportion of muddy white, and had a certain indefinable character of insanity. The hue of the lip, bearing the usual relation to that of the face, was consequently nearly black, and the entire character of the face was sensual, malignant, and even satanic. It was remarkable that the worshipful stranger suffered as little as possible of his flesh to appear, and that during his visit he did not once remove his gloves. Having stood for some moments at the door, Gerard Dow at length found breath and collectedness to bid him welcome and with a mute inclination of the head the stranger stepped forward into the room there was something indescribably odd even horrible about all his motions something undefinable that was unnatural unhuman it was as if the limbs were guided and directed by a spirit unused to the management of bodily machinery the stranger spoke hardly at all during his visit, which did not exceed half an hour, and the host himself could scarcely muster courage enough to utter the few necessary salutations and courtesies, and, indeed, such was the nervous terror which the presence of Van der Housen inspired, that very little would have made all his entertainers fly in downright panic from the room. They had not so far lost all self-possession, however, as to fail to observe two strange peculiarities of their visitor. During his stay, his eyelids did not once close, or indeed move in the slightest degree. And farther, there was a death-like stillness in his whole person, owing to the absence of the heaving motion of the chest caused by the process of respiration. These two peculiarities, though when told they may appear trifling, produced a very striking and unpleasant effect when seen and observed. Van der Hausen at length relieved the painter of Leiden of his inauspicious presence, and with no trifling sense of relief the little party heard the street door close after him. "'Dear uncle,' said Rose, "'what a frightful man! 
I would not see him again for the wealth of the States. Oh, tush, foolish girl, said Dow, whose sensations were anything but comfortable. A man may be as ugly as the devil, and yet if his heart and actions are good, he is worth all the pretty-faced perfumed puppies that walk the mall. Rose, my girl, it is very true he has not thy pretty face, but I know him to be wealthy and liberal, and were he ten times more ugly, these two virtues would be enough to counterbalance all his deformity, and if not sufficient actly to alter the shape and hue of his features, at least enough to prevent one thinking them so much amiss. Do you know, uncle, said Rose, when I saw him standing at the door, I could not get it out of my head that I saw the old painted wooden figure that used to frighten me so much in the church of St. Laurent at Rotterdam. Gerard laughed, though he could not help inwardly acknowledging the justness of the comparison. He was resolved, however, as far as he could, to check his niece's disposition to dilate upon the ugliness of her intended bridegroom, although he was not a little pleased as well as puzzled to observe that she appeared totally exempt from that mysterious dread of the stranger, which he could not disguise it from himself, considerably affected him as also his pupil, Godfrey Shalcombe. Early on the next day there arrived, from various quarters of the town, rich presents of silks, velvets, jewellery, and so forth for Rose, and also a packet directed to Gerard Dow, which, on being opened, was found to contain a contract of marriage, formally drawn up, between Wilken van der Housen of the Boom Key in Rotterdam, and Rose Valdekoust of Leiden, niece to Gerard Dow, master in the art of painting, also of the same city, and containing engagement on the part of van der Housen, to make settlements upon his bride far more splendid than he had before led her guardian to believe likely, and which were to be secured to her use in the most unexceptionable manner possible, the money being placed in the hand of Gerard Dow himself. I have no sentimental scenes to describe, no cruelty of guardians, no magnanimity of wards, no agonies or transport of lovers. The record I have to make is one of sordidness, levity, and heartlessness. In less than a week after the first interview which we have just described, the contract of marriage was fulfilled, and Shalkin saw the prize which he would have risked existence to secure carried off in solemn pomp by his repulsive rival. For two or three days he absented himself from the school. He then returned and worked, if with less cheerfulness, with far more dogged resolution than before. The stimulus of love had given place to that of ambition. Months passed away, and, contrary to his expectation, and, indeed, to the direct promise of the parties, Gerard Dow heard nothing of his niece or her worshipful spouse. The interest of the money, which was to have been demanded in quarterly sums, lay unclaimed in his hands. He began to grow extremely uneasy, Mein Herr van der Housen's direction in Rotterdam he was fully possessed of. After some irresolution, he finally determined to journey thither, a trifling undertaking and easily accomplished, and thus to satisfy himself of the safety and comfort of his ward, for whom he entertained an honest and strong affection. His search was in vain, however, no one in Rotterdam had ever heard of Meinherr van der Housen. Gerard Dow left not a house in the Boom Key untried, but all in vain. 
no one could give him any information whatever touching the object of his inquiry, and he was obliged to return to Leiden, nothing wiser and far more anxious than when he had left it. On his arrival, he hastened to the establishment from which Vanderhausen had hired the lumbering, though, considering the times, most luxurious vehicle which the bridal party had employed to convey them to Rotterdam. From the driver of this machine he learned that, having proceeded by slow stages, they had late in the evening approached Rotterdam, but that before they entered the city, and while yet nearly a mile from it, a small party of men, soberly clad, and after the old fashion, with peaked beards and moustaches, standing in the centre of the road, obstructed the further progress of the carriage. The driver reined in his horses, much fearing, from the obscurity of the hour and the loneliness of the road, that some mischief was intended. His fears were, however, somewhat allayed by his observing that these strange men carried a large litter of an antique shape, and which they immediately set down upon the pavement, whereupon the bridegroom, having opened the coach-door from within, descended, and having assisted his bride to do likewise, led her weeping bitterly and wringing her hands to the litter which they both entered. It was then raised by the men who surrounded it, and speedily carried towards the city and before it had proceeded very far, the darkness concealed it from the view of the Dutch coachman. In the inside of the vehicle he found a purse, whose contents more than thrice paid the hire of the carriage and man. He saw and could tell nothing more of Meinherr van der Housen and his beautiful lady. This mystery was a source of profound anxiety and even grief to Gerard Dow. There was evidently fraud in the dealing of Banderhausen with him, though for what purpose committed he could not imagine. He greatly doubted how far it was possible for a man possessing such a countenance to be anything but a villain, and every day that passed without his hearing from or of his niece instead of inducing him to forget his fears, on the contrary, tended more and more to aggravate them. The loss of her cheerful society tended also to depress his spirits, and in order to dispel the gloom which often crept upon his mind after his daily occupations were over, he was wont frequently to ask Shalkin to accompany him home, and share his otherwise solitary supper. One evening the painter and his pupil were sitting by the fire, having accomplished a comfortable meal, and had yielded to the silent and delicious melancholy of digestion, when their ruminations were disturbed by a loud sound at the street door, as if occasioned by some person rushing and scrambling vehemently against it. A domestic had run without delay to ascertain the cause of the disturbance, and they heard him twice or thrice interrogate the applicant for admission, but without eliciting any other answer but a sustained reiteration of the sounds. They heard him then open the hall door, and immediately there followed a light and rapid tread on the staircase. Shalkin advanced towards the door. It opened before he reached it, and Rose rushed into the room. She looked wild, fierce, and haggard with terror and exhaustion, but her dress surprised them as much as even her unexpected appearance. It consisted of a kind of white woollen wrapper, made close about the neck, and descending to the very ground. It was much deranged and travel-soiled. The poor creature had hardly entered the chamber, when she fell senseless on the floor. With some difficulty they succeeded in reviving her, and on recovering her senses 
she instantly exclaimed in a tone of terror rather than mere impatience wine wine quickly or i'm lost astonished and almost scared at the strange agitation in which the call was made they at once administered to her wishes and she drank some wine with a haste and eagerness which surprised them she had hardly swallowed it when she exclaimed with the same urgency food for god's sake food at once or i perish a considerable fragment of a roast joint was upon the table and shalkan immediately began to cut some but he was anticipated for no sooner did she see it than she caught it a more than mortal image of famine and with her hands and even with her teeth she tore off the flesh and swallowed it when the paroxysm of hunger had been a little appeased she appeared on a sudden overcome with shame or it may have been that other more agitating thoughts overpowered and scared her for she began to weep bitterly and to wring her hands oh send for a minister of god said she i am not safe till he comes send for him speedily gerard dow dispatched a messenger instantly and prevailed on his niece to allow him to surrender his bedchamber to her use he also persuaded her to retire to it at once to rest her consent was extorted upon the condition that they would not leave her for a moment oh that the holy man were here she said he can deliver me the dead and the living can never be one god has forbidden it with these mysterious words she surrendered herself to their guidance and they proceeded to the chamber which gerard dow had assigned to her use oh, do not do not leave me for a moment said she i am lost for ever if you do gerard dow's chamber was approached through a spacious apartment which they were now about to enter he and shalkan each carried a candle so that a sufficiency of light was cast upon all surrounding objects they were now entering the large chamber which as i have said communicated with dow's apartment when rose suddenly stopped and in a whisper which thrilled them both with horror she said oh god he is here he is here see see there he goes she pointed towards the door of the inner room and Shalcombe thought he saw a shadowy and ill-defined form gliding into that apartment. He drew his sword, and, raising the candle, so as to throw its light with increased distinctness upon the objects in the room, he entered the chamber into which the shadow had glided. No figure was there, nothing but the furniture which belonged to the room, and yet he could not be deceived as to the fact that something had moved before them into the chamber a sickening dread came upon him and the cold perspiration broke out in heavy drops upon his forehead nor was he more composed when he heard the increased urgency and agony of entreaty with which rose implored them not to leave her for a moment i saw him said she he's here i cannot be deceived i know him he's by me he is with me he's in the room then for god's sake as you would save me do not stir from beside me they at length prevailed upon her to lie down upon the bed where she continued to urge them to stay by her she frequently uttered incoherent sentences repeating again and again the dead and the living cannot be one god has forbidden it and then again rest to the wakeful sleep to the steep walkers these and such mysterious and broken sentences she continued to utter until the clergyman arrived gerard dow began to fear naturally enough that terror or ill-treatment had unsettled the poor girl's intellect and he half suspected by the suddenness of her appearance the unseasonableness of the hour and above all from the wildness and terror of her manner that she had made her escape from some place of confinement for lunatics and was in imminent fear of pursuit he resolved to summon medical advice as soon as the mind of his niece had been in some measure set at rest 
by the offices of the clergyman whose attendance she had so earnestly desired, and until this object had been attained, he did not venture to put any questions to her, which might possibly, by reviving painful or horrible recollections, increase her agitation. The clergyman soon arrived, a man of ascetic countenance and venerable age, one whom Gerard Dow respected very much, for as much as he was a veteran polemic, though one, perhaps, more dreaded as a combatant than beloved as a Christian, of pure morality, subtle brain, and frozen heart. He entered the chamber which communicated with that in which Rose reclined, and immediately on his arrival she requested him to pray for her as for one who lay in the hands of Satan, and who could hope for deliverance only from heaven. That you may distinctly understand all the circumstances of the event which I am going to describe, it is necessary to state the relative position of the parties who were engaged in it. The old clergyman and Shalcom were in the anteroom, of which I have already spoken. Rose lay in the inner chamber, the door of which was open, and by the side of the bed, at her urgent desire, stood her guardian. A candle burned in the bedchamber, and three were lighted in the outer apartment. The old man now cleared his voice, as if about to commence but before he had time to begin, a sudden gust of air blew out the candle, which served to illuminate the room in which the poor girl lay, and she, with hurried alarm, exclaimed, Godfrey, bring in another candle, the darkness is unsafe. Gerard Dow, forgetting for the moment her repeated injunctions in the immediate impulse, stepped from the bedchamber into the other, in order to supply what she desired. Oh, God, do not go, dear uncle! shrieked the unhappy girl, and at the same time she sprang from the bed and darted after him in order by her grasp to detain him. But the warning came too late, for scarcely had he passed the threshold, and hardly had his niece had time to utter the startling exclamation when the door which divided the two rooms closed violently after him, as if swung by a strong blast of wind. Shalkin and he both rushed to the door, but their united and desperate efforts could not avail so much as to shake it. Shriek after shriek burst from the inner chamber with all the piercing loudness of despairing terror. Shalkin and Dow applied every nerve to force open the door, but all in vain. There was no sound of struggling from within, but the scream seemed to increase in loudness, and at the same time they heard the bolts of the latticed window withdrawn, and the window itself grated upon the sill as if thrown open. One last shriek, so long and piercing and agonized as to be scarcely human, swelled from the room, and suddenly there followed a death-like silence. A light step was heard crossing the floor, as if from the bed to the window, and almost at the same instant the door gave way, and yielding to the pressure of the external applicants, nearly precipitated them into the room. It was empty. The window was open, and Shalkin sprung to a chair, and gazed out upon the street and canal below. He saw no form, but he saw, or thought he saw, the waters of the broad canal beneath, settling ring after ring in heavy circles, as if a moment before disturbed by the submission of some ponderous body. No trace of Rose was ever after found, nor was anything certain respecting a mysterious wooer discovered or even suspected. No clue whereby to trace the intricacies of the labyrinth, 
and to arrive at its solution presented itself but an incident occurred which though it will not be received by our rational readers in lieu of evidence produced nevertheless a strong and a lasting impression upon the mind of Shalcombe. Many years after the events which we have detailed, Shalcombe, then residing far away, received an intimation of his father's death and of his intended burial upon a fixed day in the church of Rotterdam. It was necessary that a very considerable journey should be performed by the funeral procession, which, as it will be readily believed, was not very numerously attended. Schalken, with difficulty, arrived in Rotterdam late in the day, upon which the funeral was appointed to take place. It had not then arrived. Evening closed in, and still it did not appear. Schalken strolled down to the church. He found it open. Notice of the arrival of the funeral had been given, and the vault in which the body was to be laid had been opened. The sexton, on seeing a well-dressed gentleman, whose object was to attend the expected obsequies, pacing the aisle of the church, hospitably invited him to share with him the comforts of a blazing fire, which, as was his custom in winter-time upon such occasions, he had kindled in the hearth of a chamber in which he was accustomed to await the arrival of such grisly guests and which communicated by a flight of steps with the vault below. In this chamber Shalcon and his entertainer seated themselves, and the sexton, after some fruitless attempts to engage his guest in conversation, was obliged to apply himself to his tobacco pipe and cam to solace his solitude. In spite of his grief and care, the fatigues of a rapid journey of nearly forty hours gradually overcame the mind and body of Godfrey Shalcon, and he sank into a deep sleep, from which he awakened by someone shaking him gently by the shoulder. He first thought that the old sexton had called him, but he was no longer in the room. He roused himself, and as soon as he could clearly see what was around him, he perceived a female form, clothed in a kind of light robe of white, part of which was so disposed as to form a veil, and in her hand she carried a lamp. She was moving rather away from him, in the direction of the flight of steps, which conducted towards the vaults. Shalcon felt a vague alarm at the sight of this figure, and at the same time an irresistible impulse to follow its guidance. He followed it towards the vaults, but when it reached the head of the stairs he paused. The figure paused also, and turning gently round, displayed by the light of the lamp it carried, the face and features of his first love, Rose Baldacoust. There was nothing horrible or even sad in the countenance. On the contrary, it wore the same arch smile which used to enchant the artist long before in his happy days. A feeling of awe and interest too intense to be resisted, prompted him to follow the spectre, if spectre it were. She descended the stairs he followed, and turning to the left through a narrow passage, she led him, to his infinite surprise, into what appeared to be an old-fashioned Dutch apartment, such as the pictures of Gerard Dow 
have served to immortalize. Abundance of costly antique furniture was disposed about the room, and in one corner stood a four-post bed with heavy black cloth curtains around it. The figure frequently turned towards him with the same arch smile, and when she came to the side of the bed, she drew the curtains, and by the light of the lamp which she held towards its contents, she disclosed to the horror-stricken painter, sitting bolt upright in the bed, the livid and demonic form of Panderhausen. Schalken had hardly seen him when he fell senseless upon the floor where he lay until discovered on the next morning by persons employed in closing the passages into the vaults. He was lying in a cell of considerable size, which had not been disturbed for a long time, and he had fallen beside a large coffin, which was supported upon small pillars, a security against the attacks of vermin. To his dying day, Schalken was satisfied of the reality of the vision which he had witnessed, and he has left behind him a curious evidence of the impression which it wrought upon his fancy, in a painting executed shortly after the event I have narrated, and which is valuable as exhibiting not only the peculiarities which have made Schalken's pictures sought after, but even more so as presenting a portrait of his early love, Rose Veldekaus, whose mysterious fate must always remain matter of speculation. End of Shalcom the Painter The Man Who Found Out A Nightmare by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. The Man Who Found Out A Nightmare by Algernon Blackwood. 1. Professor Mark Ebor, the scientist, led a double life, and the only persons who knew it were his assistant, Dr. Laidlaw, and his publishers. But a double life need not always be a bad one, and as Dr. Laidlaw and the gratified publishers well knew, the parallel lives of this particular man were equally good, and indefinitely produced would certainly have ended in a heaven somewhere that can suitably contain such strangely opposite characteristics as his remarkable personality combined. For Mark Ebor, F.R.S., etc., etc., was that unique combination hardly ever met with in actual life, a man of science and a mystic. As the first, his name stood in the gallery of the great, and as the second, but there came the mystery, for under the pseudonym of Pilgrim, the author of that brilliant series of books that appealed to so many, his identity was as well concealed as that of the anonymous writer of the weather reports in a daily newspaper. Thousands read the sanguine, optimistic, stimulating little books that issued annually from the pen of Pilgrim, and thousands bore their daily burdens better for having read, while the press generally agreed that the author, besides being an incorrigible enthusiast and optimist, was also a woman but no one ever succeeded in penetrating the veil of anonymity and discovering that Pilgrim and the biologist were one and the same person. Mark Ebor, as Dr. Laidlaw knew him in his laboratory, was one man, but Mark Ebor, as he sometimes saw him after work, was over, with rapt eyes and ecstatic face, discussing the possibilities of union with God and the future of the human race, was quite another. I have always held, as you know, he was saying one evening, as he sat in a little study beyond the laboratory with his assistant and intimate, that vision should play a large part in the life of the awakened man, not to be regarded as infallible, of course, but to be observed and made use of as a guidepost to possibilities. 
"'I am aware of your peculiar views, sir,' the young doctor put in deferentially, yet with a certain impatience. "'For visions come from a region of the consciousness where observation and experiment are out of the question,' pursued the other with enthusiasm, not noticing the interruption. "'And while they should be checked by reason afterwards, they should not be laughed at or ignored. All inspiration, I hold, is of the nature of interior vision.' and all our best knowledges come, such as my confirmed belief, as a sudden revelation to the brain prepared to receive it. Prepared by hard work first, by concentration, by the closest possible study of ordinary phenomena, Dr. Laidlaw allowed himself to observe, perhaps, sighed the other, but by a process nonetheless of spiritual illumination. The best match in the world will not light a candle unless the wick be first suitably prepared. It was Laidlaw's turn to sigh. He knew so well the impossibility of arguing with his chief when he was in the regions of the mystic, but at the same time the respect he felt for his tremendous attainments was so sincere that he always listened with attention and deference, wondering how far the great man would go and to what end this curious combination of logic and illumination would eventually lead him. Only last night, continued the elder man, a sort of light coming into his rugged features, the vision came to me again, the one that has haunted me at intervals ever since my youth and that will not be denied. Dr. Laidlaw fidgeted in his chair. "'About the tablets of the gods, you mean? "'And that they lie somewhere hidden in the sands?' he said patiently. "'A sudden gleam of interest came into his face "'as he turned to catch the professor's reply. "'And that I am to be the one to find them, "'to decipher them, and to give the great knowledge to the world.' "'Who will not believe,' laughed Laidlaw shortly, "'yet interested in spite of his thinly-veiled contempt.' because even the keenest minds, in the right sense of the word, are hopelessly unscientific," replied the other gently, his face positively aglow with the memory of his vision. Yet what is more likely, he continued after a moment's pause, peering into space with rapt eyes that saw things too wonderful for exact language to describe, than that there should have been given to man in the first ages of the world some record of the purpose and problem that had been set him to solve? In a word, he cried, fixing his shining eyes upon the face of his perplexed assistant, that God's messengers in the far-off ages should have given to his creatures some full statement of the secret of the world, of the secret of the soul, of the meaning of life and death, the explanation of our being here, and to what great end we are destined in the ultimate fullness of things? Dr. Laidlaw sat speechless. These outbursts of mystical enthusiasm he had witnessed before. With any other man he would not have listened to a single sentence. But to Professor Ebor, man of knowledge and profound investigator, he listened with respect, because he regarded this condition as temporary and pathological and in some sense a reaction from the intense strain of the prolonged mental concentration of many days. He smiled with something between sympathy and resignation as he met the other's rapt gaze. "'But you have said, sir, at other times, that you consider the ultimate secrets to be screened from all possible the ultimate secrets, yes,' came the unperturbed reply." but that there lies buried somewhere an indestructible record of the secret meaning of a life, originally known to men in the days of their pristine innocence, I am convinced. And by this strange vision so often vouchsafed to me, I am equally sure that one day it shall be given to me to announce to a weary world this glorious and terrific message. And he continued at great length, in a glowing language, to describe the species of vivid dream that had come to him at intervals since earliest childhood, showing in detail how he discovered these very tablets of the gods, and proclaimed their splendid contents, whose precise nature was always, however, withheld from him in the vision, to a patient and suffering humanity. 
the scrutator sir well described pilgrim as the apostle of hope said the young doctor gently when he had finished and now if that reviewer could hear you speak and realize from what strange depths comes your simple faith the professor held up his hand and the smile of a little child broke over his face like sunshine in the morning half the good my books do would be instantly destroyed he said sadly they would say that i wrote with my tongue in my cheek but wait he added significantly wait till i find these tablets of the gods wait till i hold the solutions of the old world problems in my hands wait till the light of this new revelation breaks upon confused humanity and it wakes to find its bravest hopes justified and then my dear laidlaw he broke off suddenly but the doctor cleverly guessing the thought in his mind caught him up immediately perhaps this very summer he said trying hard to make the suggestion keep pace with honesty in your explorations in assyria your digging in the remote civilization of what was once chaldea you may find what you dream of the professor held up his hand in the smile of a fine old face perhaps he murmured softly perhaps and the young doctor thanking the gods of science that his leader's aberrations were of so harmless a character went home strong in the certitude of his knowledge of externals proud that he was able to refer his visions to self-suggestion and wondering complacently whether in his old age he might not after all suffer himself from visitations of the very kind that afflicted his respected chief and as he got into bed and thought again of his master's rugged face and finely shaped head and the deep lines traced by years of work and self-discipline he turned over on his pillow and fell asleep with a sigh that was half of wonder half of regret two it was in february nine months later when dr laidlaw made his way to charing cross to meet his chief after his long absence of travel and exploration the vision about the so-called tablets of the gods had meanwhile passed almost entirely from his memory there were few people in the train for the stream of traffic was now running the other way and he had no difficulty in finding the man he had come to meet the shock of white hair beneath the low-crowned felt hat was alone enough to distinguish him by easily here i am at last exclaimed the professor somewhat wearily clasping his friend's hand as he listened to the young doctor's warm greetings and questions here i am a little older and much dirtier than when you last saw me he glanced down laughingly at his travel-stained garments and much wiser said laidlaw with a smile as he bustled about the platform for porters and gave his chief the latest scientific news at last they came down to practical considerations and your luggage where is that you must have tons of it i suppose said laidlaw hardly anything professor eber answered nothing in fact but what you see nothing but this handbag laughed the other thinking he was joking and a small portmanteau in the van was the quiet reply i have no other luggage you have no other luggage repeated laidlaw turning sharply to see if he were in earnest why should i need more the professor added simply something in the man's face or voice or manner the doctor hardly knew which suddenly struck him as strange there was a change in him a change so profound so little on the surface that is that at first he had not become aware of it for a moment it was as though an utterly alien personality stood before him in that noisy bustling throng here in all the homely friendly turmoil of a charing cross crowd a curious feeling of cold passed over his heart touching his life with icy finger so that he actually trembled and felt afraid he looked up quickly at his friend, his mind working with startled and unwelcome thoughts. "'Only this?' he repeated, indicating the bag. "'But where's all this stuff you went away with? And have you brought nothing home? No treasures?' "'This is all I have,' the other said briefly. 
The pale smile that went with the words caused the doctor a second indescribable sensation of uneasiness. Something was very wrong, something was very queer. He wondered now that he had not noticed it sooner. The rest follows, of course, by slow freight, he added tactfully, and as naturally as possible. But come, sir, you must be tired and in want of food after your long journey. I'll get a taxi at once, and we can see about the other luggage afterwards. It seemed to him he hardly knew quite what he was saying. The change in his friend had come upon him so suddenly, and now grew upon him more and more distressingly. Yet he could not make out exactly in what it consisted. A terrible suspicion began to take shape in his mind, troubling him dreadfully. "'I am neither very tired nor in need of food, thank you,' the professor said quietly. "'And this is all I have. There is no luggage to follow. I have brought home nothing. Nothing but what you see,' his words conveyed finality. They got into a taxi, tipped the porter, who had been staring in amazement at the venerable figure of the scientist, and were conveyed slowly and noisily to the house in the north of London where the laboratory was, the scene of their labors of years. And the whole way Professor Ebor uttered no word, nor did Dr. Laidlaw find the courage to ask a single question. It was only late that night before he took his departure, as the two men were standing before the fire in the study, that study where they had discussed so many problems of vital and absorbing interest, that Dr. Laidlaw at last found strength to come to the point with direct questions. The professor had been giving him a superficial and desultory account of his travels, of his journeys by camel, of his encampments among the mountains and in the desert, and of his explorations among the buried temples, and deeper, into the waste of the prehistoric sands, when suddenly the doctor came to the desired point, with a kind of nervous rush, almost like a frightened boy. "'And you found?' he began stammering, looking hard at the other's dreadfully altered face, from which every line of hope and cheerfulness seemed to have been obliterated, as a sponge wipes markings from a slate. "'You found?' "'I found,' replied the other, in a solemn voice. "'It was the voice of the mystic rather than the man of science. "'I found what I went to seek. "'The vision never once failed me. "'It led me straight to the place like a star in the heavens. "'I found the tablets of the gods.' "'Dr. Laidlaw caught his breath.' and steadied himself on the back of a chair. The words fell like particles of ice upon his heart. For the first time, the professor had uttered the well-known phrase without the glow of light and wonder in its face that had always accompanied it. "'You have brought them?' he faltered. "'I have brought them home,' said the other, in a voice with a ring like iron. "'And I have deciphered them.' profound despair, the bloom of outer darkness, the dead sound of a hopeless soul, freezing in the utter cold of space, seemed to fill in the pauses between the brief sentences. A silence followed, during which Dr. Laidlaw saw nothing but the white face before him alternately fade and return, and it was like the face of a dead man. They are, alas, indestructible, he heard the voice continue with its even metallic ring. Indestructible, Laidlaw repeated mechanically, hardly knowing what he was saying. Again a silence of several minutes passed, during which, with a creeping cold about his heart, he stood and stared into the eyes of the man he had known and loved so long, ay, and worshipped, too the man who had first opened his own eyes when they were blind, and had led him to the gates of knowledge, and no little distance along the difficult path beyond, the man who, in another direction, had passed on the strength of his faith into the hearts of thousands by his books. "'I may see them?' he asked at last in a low voice he hardly recognized 
as his own. "'You will let me know their message?' Professor Ebor kept his eyes fixedly upon his assistant's face as he answered, with a smile that was more like the grin of death than a living human smile. "'When I am gone,' he whispered, "'when I have passed away, then you shall find them, and read the translation I have made. And then, too, in your turn, you must try, with the latest resources of science at your disposal to aid you, to compass their utter destruction. He paused a moment, and his face grew pale as the face of a corpse. Until that time, he added presently, without looking up, I must ask you not to refer to the subject again, and to keep my confidence meanwhile. Absolutely. Three. A year passed slowly by, and at the end of it Dr. Laidlaw had found it necessary to sever his working connection with his friend and one-time leader. Professor Ebor was no longer the same man. The light had gone out of his life. The laboratory was closed. He no longer put pen to paper or applied his mind to a single problem. In the short space of a few months he had passed from a hale and hearty man of late middle life to the condition of old age, a man collapsed and on the edge of dissolution. Death, it was plain, lay waiting for him in the shadows of any day, and he knew it. To describe faithfully the nature of this profound alteration in his character and temperament is not easy, but Dr. Laidlaw summed it up to himself in three words. Loss of hope. The splendid mental powers remained indeed undimmed, but the incentive to use them, to use them for the help of others, had gone. The character still held to its fine and unselfish habits of years, but the far goal to which they had been the leading strings had faded away. The desire for knowledge, knowledge for its own sake, had died, and the passionate hope which hitherto had animated with tireless energy the heart and brain of this splendidly equipped intellect, had suffered total eclipse. The central fires had gone out. Nothing was worth doing, thinking, working for. There was nothing to work for any longer. The professor's first step was to recall as many of his books as possible. His second, to close his laboratory and stop all research. He gave no explanation. He invited no questions. His whole personality crumbled away, so to speak, till his daily life became a mere mechanical process of clothing the body, feeding the body, keeping it in good health so to avoid physical discomfort, and above all, doing nothing that could interfere with sleep. The professor did everything he could to lengthen the hours of sleep, and therefore of forgetfulness. It was all clear enough to Dr. Laidlaw. A weaker man, he knew, would have sought to lose himself in one form or another of sensual indulgence. Sleeping draughts, drink, the first pleasures that come to hand. Self-destruction would have been the method of a little bolder type. And deliberate evil-doing, poisoning with his awful knowledge all he could, the means of still another kind of man. Mark Ebor was none of these. He held himself under fine control, facing silently and without complaint the terrible facts he honestly believed himself to have been unfortunate enough to discover. Even to his intimate friend and assistant, Dr. Laidlaw, he vouchsafed no word of true explanation or lament. He went straight forward to the end, knowing well that the end was not very far away. And death came very quietly one day to him, as he was sitting in the armchair of the study, directly facing the doors of the laboratory, the doors that no longer opened. Dr. Laidlaw, by happy chance, was with him at the time, and just able to reach his side in response to the sudden painful efforts for breath, just in time, too, to catch the murmured words that fell from the pallid lips, like a message from the other side of the grave. Read them, if you must, and if you can, destroy. But 
His voice sank so low that Dr. Laidlaw only just caught the dying syllables. But never, never give them to the world. And like a gray bundle of dust loosely gathered up in an old garment, the professor sank back into his chair and expired. But this was only the death of the body. His spirit had died two years before. 4. The estate of the dead man was small and uncomplicated, and Dr. Laidlaw, his sole executor and residuary legatee, had no difficulty in settling it up. A month after the funeral he was sitting alone in his upstairs library, the last sad duties completed, and his mind full of poignant memories and regrets for the loss of a friend he had revered and loved, and to whom his debt was so incalculably great. The last two years, indeed, had been for him terrible, to watch the swift decay of the greatest combination of heart and brain he had ever known, and to realize he was powerless to help was a source of profound grief to him that would remain to the end of his days. At the same time, an insatiable curiosity possessed him. The study of dementia was, of course, outside his special province as a specialist, but he knew enough of it to understand how small a matter might be the actual cause of how great an illusion, and he had been devoured from the very beginning by a ceaseless and increasing anxiety to know what the professor had found in the sands of Chaldea what these precious tablets of the gods might be, and particularly, for this was the real cause that had sapped the man's sanity and hope, what the inscription was that he had believed to have deciphered thereon. The curious feature of it all to his own mind was that, whereas his friend had dreamed of finding a message of glorious hope and comfort, he had apparently found, so far as he had found anything intelligible at all, and not invented the whole thing in his dementia, that the secret of the world and the meaning of life and death was of so terrible a nature that it robbed the heart of courage and the soul of hope. What, then, could be the contents of the little brown parcel the professor had bequeathed to him with his pregnant, dying sentences? Actually, his hand was trembling as he turned to the writing-table, and began slowly to unfasten a small old-fashioned desk on which the small gilt initials M.E. stood forth as a melancholy memento. He put the key into the lock and half-turned it, then suddenly he stopped and looked about him. Was that a sound at the back of the room? It was just as though someone had laughed, and then tried to smother the laugh with a cough. A slight shiver ran over him as he stood listening. "'This is absurd,' he said aloud. "'Too absurd for belief that I should be so nervous. "'It's the effect of curiosity unduly prolonged.' He smiled a little sadly, and his eyes wandered to the blue summer sky, and the plane trees swaying in the wind below his window. "'It's the reaction,' he continued, "'the curiosity of two years to be quenched in a single moment.' The nervous tension, of course, must be considerable. He turned back to the brown desk and opened it without further delay. His hand was firm now, and he took out the paper parcel that lay inside without a tremor. It was heavy. A moment later there lay on the table before him a couple of weather-worn plaques of grey stone. They looked like stone, although they felt like metal, on which he saw markings of a curious character that might have been the mere tracings of natural forces through the ages, or, equally well, the half-obliterated hieroglyphics cut upon their surface in past centuries by the more or less untutored hand of a common scribe. He lifted each stone in turn and examined it carefully. It seemed to him that a faint glow of heat passed from the substance into his skin, and he put them down again suddenly as with a gesture of uneasiness. A very clever or a very imaginative man, he said to himself, who could squeeze the secrets of life and death from such broken lines as these. Then he turned to a yellow envelope lying beside them on the desk, with the single word on the outside in the writing of the professor. 
the word translation. Now, he thought, taking it up with a sudden violence to conceal his nervousness, now for the great solution, now to learn the meaning of the worlds, and why mankind was made, and why discipline is worth while, and sacrifice and pain the true law of advancement. There was the shadow of a sneer in his voice, and yet something in him shivered at the same time. He held the envelope, as though weighing it in his hand, his mind pondering many things. Then curiosity won the day, and he suddenly tore it open with the gesture of an actor who tears open a letter on the stage, knowing there is no real writing inside at all. A page of finely written script in the late scientist's handwriting lay before him. He read it through from beginning to end, missing no word, uttering each syllable distinctly under his breath as he read. The pallor of his face grew ghastly as he neared the end. He began to shake all over as with ague. His breath came heavily in gasps. He still gripped the sheet of paper. However, and deliberately, as by an intense effort of will, read it through a second time from beginning to end. And this time, as the last syllable dropped from his lips, the whole face of the man flamed with a sudden and terrible anger. His skin became deep, deep red, and he clenched his teeth. With all the strength of his vigorous soul, he was struggling to keep control of himself. For perhaps five minutes he stood there, beside the table, without stirring a muscle. He might have been carved out of stone. His eyes were shut and only the heaving of the chest betrayed the fact that he was a living being. Then, with a strange quietness, he lit a match and applied it to the sheet of paper he held in his hand. The ashes fell slowly about him, piece by piece, and he blew them from the window sill into the air, his eyes following them as they floated away on the summer wind that breathed so warmly over the world. He turned back slowly into the room. Although his actions and movements were absolutely steady and controlled, it was clear that we was on the edge of violent action. Our hurricane might burst upon the still room any moment. His muscles were tense and rigid. Then suddenly he whitened, collapsed, and sank backwards into a chair, like a tumbled bundle of inert matter. He had fainted. In less than half an hour he recovered consciousness and sat up. As before, he made no sound. Not a syllable passed his lips. He rose quietly and looked about the room. Then he did a curious thing. Taking a heavy stick from the rack in the corner, he approached the mantelpiece, and with a heavy shattering blow he smashed the clock to pieces. The glass fell in shivering atoms. "'Cease your lying voice forever,' he said in a curiously still, even tone. "'There is no such thing as time.' He took the watch from his pocket, swung it round several times by the long gold chain, smashed it into smithereens against the wall with a single blow, and then walked into his laboratory next door and hung its broken body on the bones of the skeleton in the corner of the room. Let one damned mockery hang upon another, he said, smiling oddly. Delusions, both of you, and cruel as false. He slowly moved back to the front room. He stopped opposite the bookcase where stood in a row the scriptures of the world, choicely bound and exquisitely printed, the late professor's most treasured possession, and next to them several books signed Pilgrim. One by one he took them from the shelf and hurled them through the open window. A devil's dreams, a devil's foolish dreams, he cried with a vicious laugh. Presently he stopped from sheer exhaustion. He turned his eyes slowly to the wall opposite, where hung a weird array of eastern swords and daggers, scimitars and spears, the collections of many journeys. He crossed the room and ran his finger along the edge. 
his mind seemed to waver. No, he muttered presently, not that way. There are easier and better ways than that. He took his hat and passed downstairs into the street. Five. It was five o'clock, and the June sun lay hot upon the pavement. He felt the metal doorknob burn the palm of his hand. Ah, Laidlaw, this is well met, cried a voice at his elbow. I was in the act of coming to see you. I've a case that will interest you, and besides, I remembered that you flavored your tea with orange leaves. And I admit, it was Alexis Stephan, the great hypnotic doctor. I had no tea today, Laidlaw said in a dazed manner after staring for a moment, as though the other had struck him in the face. A new idea had entered his mind. "'What's the matter?' asked Dr. Stephen quickly. "'Something's wrong with you. It's this sudden heat or overwork. Come, man, let's go inside.' A sudden light broke upon the face of the younger man. The light of a heaven-sent inspiration. He looked into his friend's face and told a direct lie. "'Odd,' he said. "'I myself was just coming to see you. "'I have something of great importance to test your confidence with. "'But in your house, please,' as Stephen urged him towards his own door, "'in your house. "'It's only round the corner, and I—I I cannot go back there to my rooms till I have told you. "'I'm your patient for the moment,' he added stammeringly, "'as soon as they were seated in the privacy of the hypnotist's sanctum, and I want, uh, my dear Laidlaw, interrupt the other in that soothing voice of command, which had suggested to many a suffering soul that the cure for its pain lay in the powers of its own reawakened will. I am always at your service, as you know. You have only to tell me what I can do for you, and I will do it. He showed every desire to help him out. His manner was indescribably tactful and direct. Dr. Laidlaw looked up into his face. "'I surrender my will to you,' he said, already calmed by the other's healing presence, "'and I want you to treat me hypnotically, and at once. "'I want you to suggest to me,' his voice became very tense, "'that I shall forget, forget till I die, "'everything that has occurred to me during the last two hours. "'Till I die, mind,' he added with solemn emphasis." till I die. He floundered and stammered like a frightened boy. Alexis Stephen looked at him fixedly without speaking. And further, Laidlaw continued, I want you to ask me no questions. I wish to forget forever something I have recently discovered, something so terrible and yet so obvious that I can hardly understand why it is not patent to every mind in the world. For I have had a moment of absolute clear vision, of merciless clairvoyance. But I want no one else in the whole world to know what it is, least of all, old friend, yourself. He talked in utter confusion, and hardly knew what he was saying, but the pain on his face and the anguish in his voice were an instant passport to the other's heart. "'Nothing is easier,' replied Dr. Stephen, after a hesitation so slight that the other probably did not even notice it. "'Come into my other room where we shall not be disturbed. I can heal you. Your memory of the last two hours shall be wiped out as though it had never been. You can trust me absolutely.' "'I know I can,' Laidlaw said simply as he followed him in. Six. An hour later they passed back into the front room again. The sun was already behind the houses opposite, and the shadows began to gather. I went off easily, laid last. You were a little obstinate at first, but though you came in like a lion, you went out like a lamb. I let you sleep a bit afterwards. Dr. Stephen kept his eyes rather steadily upon his friend's face. What were you doing by the fire before you came here, he asked, pausing in a casual tone as he lit a cigarette and handed the case to his patient. I? Let me see. Oh, I know. I was worrying my way through poor old Ebor's papers and things. I'm his executor, you know. Then I got weary and came out for a whiff of air. 
He spoke lightly and with perfect naturalness. Obviously, he was telling the truth. I prefer specimens to papers, he laughed cheerily. I know, I know, said Dr. Stephen, holding a lighted match for the cigarette. His face wore an expression of content. The experiment had been a complete success. The memory of the last two hours was wiped out utterly. Laidlaw was already chatting gaily and easily about a dozen other things that interested him. Together they went out into the street, and at his door Dr. Stephen left him with a joke and a wry face that made his friend laugh heartily. "'Don't dine on the professor's old papers by mistake,' he cried as he vanished down the street. Dr. Laidlaw went up to his study at the top of the house. Halfway down, he met his housekeeper, Mrs. Fewings. She was flustered and excited, and her face was very red and perspiring. "'There have been burglars here,' she cried excitedly. "'Or something funny. All your things is just anyhow, sir. I found everything all about everywhere.' She was very confused. In this orderly and very precise establishment, it was unusual to find a thing out of place. "'Oh, my specimens!' cried the doctor, dashing up the rest of the stairs at top speed. "'Have they been touched, or—' He flew to the door of the laboratory. Mrs. Fewings panted up heavily behind him. "'The laboratory ain't been touched,' she explained breathlessly. "'But they smashed the library clock, and they've hung your gold watch, sir, on the skeleton's hands.' and the books that weren't no value they flung out of the window just like so much rubbish they must have been wild drunk dr laidlaw sir the young scientist made a hurried examination of the rooms nothing of value was missing he began to wonder what kind of burglars they were he looked up sharply at mrs fewing standing in the doorway for a moment he seemed to cast about in his mind for something odd he said at length I only left here an hour ago, and everything was all right then. Was it, sir? Yes, sir. She glanced sharply at him. Her room looked out upon the courtyard, and she must have seen the books come crashing down, and also have heard her master leave the house a few minutes later. And what's this rubbish the brutes have left, he cried, taking up two slabs of worn gray stone on the writing table. Bath brick or something, I do declare. He looked very sharply again at the confused and troubled housekeeper. Throw them on the dust heap, Mrs. Fewings, and, and let me know if anything is missing in the house, and I will notify the police this evening. When she left the room, he went into the laboratory and took his watch off the skeleton's fingers. His face wore a troubled expression, but after a moment's thought it cleared again. His memory was a complete blank. "'I suppose I left it on the writing-table when I went out to take the air,' he said, and there was no one present to contradict him. He crossed to the window and blew carelessly some ashes of burned paper from the sill, and stood watching them as they floated away lazily over the tops of the trees. End of The Man Who Found Out a Nightmare by Algernon Blackwood